So as I was preparing this sermon this morning, I was uh, reminded of a story that I thought I'd share with you guys. There was a, a lady who was at work one day, and her daughter called and said, Mom, I'm sick. I need some help. I need you to come home right now. And she's like, are you sure you can't wait? You sure it's like really sick? Do I, I got to leave work? She said, no, I really need you to get some medicine and come home. So she did. She left work. She talked with her boss and got off on the road, and then she went over to the drugstore. And it was starting to rain, a little bit cloudy, starting to sprinkle a little, and she's like, well, I'm just going to be in and out. So I'll, I'll be fine. I don't need an umbrella. I'll be fine. So famous last words, right? So she goes into the drugstore, and she gets the medicine that her daughter needed and gets everything paid for. She comes out. It's starting to rain a little bit harder, but not too bad. And she runs over to her car just to realize that she locked her keys in the car. Oops. Yeah, it's going to be one of those days. So we uh, know how that kind of thing goes, and it starts raining harder and harder and harder, and she can't get the keys for anything. She can get her door open, nothing. So she goes back in, and she's like, there's a couple of young guys in the drugstore, so let me go see if they can help me. Sure enough, they didn't know anything about cars. They had never opened a, a, a locked car without a key before. And so they give her a coat hanger and say, here, best of luck to you. <laughs> Off she goes trying to jimmy her door open and to no avail. And so she prays, God, help me. I need somebody to help me. And I don't know what to do. Now, clearly this is before cell phones because everybody else would just call somebody and wait in the drugstore. But in this scenario, she didn't have one. She was a, wasn't able to get in. It's just pouring down rain, and suddenly a pickup truck pulls up next to her. It was kind of an old beat-up truck. The guy who got out of it was a bigger dude. He had scars and tattoos. He looked really rough, kind of like not the kind of guy you want to run into all by yourself. Um, and she says, oh, she runs over and she gives him a big hug. And she says, sir, I really need help getting my keys out of my car. My door's locked and I can't get in. And it's, I, I need to get this medicine home to my daughter. Can you help me? And so he looks at the hanger. He says, sure. He takes, takes the hanger about 13 seconds later. The door's open. And she gives him another big hug. And she says, thank you. You're a miracle. You're such a good person. And she goes, no, I'm not. She goes, no, you helped me. And my daughter gets her medicine. You're such a good person. Thank you so much. And she, he goes, I was just let out of prison for car theft. <laughs> and you know what she said? Thank you, Lord, for sending a professional. <laughs> so I spent a lot of time praying and thinking about what I was going to talk about today. And Reed had told me several weeks ago. So I figured I'd be very prepared and have everything going. And I was going to talk with you about prayer. And then Thursday hit. And I decided not to talk about that at all. So God has really been getting after me about a few things lately and helping me to grow and, and mature in my faith. And so today what I'd like to do is in our not so traditional service, as I'd already told you, talk with you a little bit about what God's talking to me about. Share with you what, what he's put on my heart and hopefully it might be something that you guys can jump in on too. Today I want to talk about the uh, first chapter of Acts. Now we've talked about the first chapter of Acts before. Uh, we talked about, you know, the day of Pentecost when thousands of people were saved because the Holy Spirit came on the disciples and just allowed them to do some amazing things. And thousands of people came to know the Lord that day. But I want to talk to you about what happened before that. I want to talk to you about the first half of the first chapter of Acts. It's a story where the disciples were with Jesus, and he gives them his very last words on this earth before he ascends to heaven. And what he says is, is pretty profound. Now, everything Jesus says is pretty profound. You know, I don't think anything was accidentally said, but I, this always has been something that has hit hard on my, my life as I read through this. And to give you a little background, a bit of a background on the story, I don't know if you guys are like me, but when I had read this story and I'd heard this story and I know this story I always kind of pictured it as Jesus was like on this cliff with his disciples and they were just in awe of him and he's glowing and you know all this stuff and there's this big beautiful background going on and there was a, 
a cloud that came and Jesus gave them this commission and then just had this Hollywood-esque kind of ascension into heaven. Well, that's not actually how it happened, obviously. Nothing in Jesus' life that we see in the Bible points to us as glamorous and glorious and that he just had the best of everything. Um, in fact, it was usually the opposite. So in this case, he's actually just having dinner with his disciples. They're just sitting down and eating. And how many times have they done that with him? You know, countless times most likely. So they're just sitting there eating. They have no reason to assume that anything different is going to happen at the end of this meal. But it does. The, the most amazing thing happens. It changes their entire life. He actually leaves and ascends to heaven, and they don't ever see him physically again. But before he does that, he says a few important things. So let's pick up in Acts 1, uh, verse 7 and 8. And it says, He said to them, It's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all of Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So my thought immediately upon reading this and hearing this is, Wow, that's a big task. How many disciples were there? Eleven. Eleven. Well, they brought, they're brought. they going to bring in the next one, right? But um, there's eleven at the time. There's probably a few other people that are sitting there with him, you know, uh, most likely. But to the very ends of the earth, they're supposed to share the gospel, the good news. Now... Their world was much smaller than what ours is. It was probably the same size, but they didn't know about it, right? So, um, but still a very big place, a daunting task. And so I kind of can feel for the disciples at this point. Not only has he told them that, but then he completely went away. He disappeared, and they didn't know where he went. Do you know the Bible tells us the angels came and said, why are you looking into the sky? They didn't know he was, what was going on. So at the end of the day, there they are with this big task, and kind of, I guess, I'd have to think wondering what to do with it. I, a lot of times, will put those disciples on a pedestal, right? I mean, after all, they were Jesus' disciples. They saw the miracles. They helped perform miracles. They, they were right there with him the whole time. But then I have to step back and think they probably were just like the rest of us, Right? We have Jesus in our lives. We've all seen or heard of miracles that have taken place. But we aren't sitting out there just these gung-ho, on fire, let's go tell everyone we know about Jesus kind of people. All right? That's just not our society. In fact, our society looks down on that kind of thing and has all sorts of fun names and words that they call people that do that. But they were probably feeling the same thing, a little bit of anxiety, a little bit of um, unsuredness, not knowing what to do. But they had a real reason to shy away from this, because just like in today's day and age, it wasn't cool to be a Christian. In fact, they were so far as killing people who were Christians, so it was worse than our day and age. I mean, even Peter does not denied him three times, right? And that's Peter. Paul, he was an apostle, I'll give you that, but, you know, he actually um, spent many years in prison because of his faith, right? None of these guys had it easy. You know, and the Bible stories that we hear and things, I think sometimes make it easiest for us to think that, hey, they were different than us. They could do things we couldn't do, and that's not the case. So, we talk about discipleship a lot. Discipleship is huge, and that's what this is telling us. Go out and make disciples, right? We need to, to do this. We need to be the witnesses. Where do we find the people to disciple? At home. At home, right. <clears throat> you can find them anywhere, right? These are rookie Christians that I like to call them. Right? They're brand new believers, and we need to go to these brand new believers, and we need to tell them about Jesus and, at, a, at a level that encourages them to grow, to learn more about him, to deepen their relationship with him. And in turn, God does this really cool thing, and he deepens our relationship with him while we're doing that. And discipleship is a huge thing. 
But let's, let's take a quick minute, and if we look around our room, I don't see any rookies sitting out here. And that's what God's been talking with me about. So where do we find our rookies? Well, they were found right where we were found before we knew Jesus. They live in the middle of this messy, dirty world that we all call home. They come from all walks of life. They have good times. They have bad times. And just like everyone else, they're trying their best just to make it day to day. There are people who were just like us at one time in our lives who knew there just had to be something more in this world but couldn't quite find what it was because they didn't know how to have a relationship with Jesus. Everyone here that we're sitting with has that hope, right? They have the hope of Christ. In their lives, we all know we're going to heaven. We have uh, bad days and good days, but at the end of the day, what makes us different is we have that hope. So many people don't have that. So if you guessed by this point, we're probably going to be talking more about evangelism than discipleship today. And I know, all right, without even asking for a show of hands, this is everybody's comfort zone. And we're all excited to jump in and do this. So uh, let's just get going. All right, if I had to guess, one of the things Christians, aside from standing up and talking in front of a group of people, hate to do probably more than do that, than stand up in front of people, is go out and tell other people about Jesus, right? And I would have to say that one of the reasons I would think from people I've talked to and just using my own head, um, some of the fears I've had is, you know, it brings up all sorts of concerns. There's potentials for rejection. If you're talking to friends or colleagues, they may judge you or treat you differently. Um, I think most of it though really is because we don't know how to start. It's uncomfortable to think about going up and knocking on somebody's door and saying, do you know Jesus? Or do you know where you'd go if you were to die tonight, as was popular several years back? And it really isn't that difficult. There's a lot of things that we can do to evangelize. And Jesus actually kind of gives us a hint right here in, in Acts. Let's look at, at verse 8 one more time. Let's see what Jesus says about where or how we can start our evangelism. Where should he start? He says, You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now there's a lot packed into that little tiny statement right there. But where is he telling them to start? Home. Home. Jerusalem. Right? Back up here in verse 40, if you read that, you can see that Jesus told them not to leave Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit had been given to them as a gift from the Father. And that hasn't happened yet, so they're all still right there where they live in Jerusalem. They aren't going anywhere else. Now, I remember in many of the churches that I've been in, we've done missions, right? We've had outreach. We've had evangelism opportunities. And I remember just looking at stages from the, the pews or the chairs and looking up on the front, and there's a stage with a, a cardboard cutout of how much money we've raised to dig a well for some far-off country. That's wonderful. I have nothing bad to say about that. We should be doing that. I've also sat through missionary services, many messages from um, missionaries or people who have gone on missions trips about all the hurting and broke people that they saw in these other countries. And people are asking for money to go on more missions trips, and, and we should fund that, and we should do that. And I have nothing bad to say about any of that. But it wasn't often that I saw, if ever, a cardboard cutout of the money that we're raising to help the homeless people right outside our front door. It wasn't ever that I saw people say, hey, let's go do this and reach out to the neighborhood um, and just find a way to do it. Now there are organizations that do it and churches do it. I'm saying my experience with it has been different. And I think that we sometimes find it easier to go to the ends of the earth than we do to go right outside our front door. And that's what God's asking me right now. What I've been dealing with this week, you know, 
the Holy Spirit hit me pretty hard. And I'm just going to be honest with you. And I, I was honest with the Holy Spirit. I mean, there's no point in lying to him. He already knows. Then you got to repent anyway. So um, might as well just be straight up. And I felt him ask me, what was I doing right now to further God's kingdom? And I had to say, not much. I don't ever want to have to say that again. Now, it's easy in life. And, you know, we've had some trials in our life. And, you know, many of you know what's going on and what has gone on um, over the last several years with me. And it's, it's easy for us to get inundated with trouble. It's easy for us to get inundated with work. It's easy for us to find other things to do. But it's not the right thing for us to do. And God has really been wanting me to, to, to grab a hold of that and figure that out. And so we have an awesome opportunity right here where we're located. And we've talked about that since before we even came here. We're across the street from an international language school. We live in a community where there's people who are walking around. We're right next door to a plasma donation center. We're here where people need help. We're here where people want help, but don't necessarily know where to find it and don't know where to find eternal help. We might not have the best building. We might not have a perfect sign on the side of the road. We might not have a, you know, such a, such a full congregation that we need to have parking attendants and people ushering people in to find the two seats that are still free. But we got a lot that we can offer. We got 10 people in this room who love Jesus and are able to make a huge difference in the lives of those around us. We All we have to do is be willing to do it. My dad quoted a verse all the time when I was growing up. 1 Peter 3.15. And it, it, it got to the point where it almost, you know, it was like, oh, okay, here we go again kind of thing. You know, it was frequent. But it was good, and I'm glad he did it because it sticks in my head. It says, But in our hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Right? I have to ask myself, am I putting myself in situations where people who don't have the hope that I have are able to see that hope in me? Or do I hang out with Christians? Am I sitting in a place in my life at work where... I'm able to share the gospel. Now, I work at home, right? So I don't have a lot of coworkers who are sitting right next to me, but I talk to a lot of them on the phone. I talk to a lot of them on Zoom and everything else. Um, I send lots of emails, and I can be kind in those. I can do things that other people aren't doing. I can show compassion and grace. Just anything that will help them to see that there's something different in me and maybe ask me what that is. And I ask you guys the same questions. Are you doing that? Are you putting yourself in positions where everyone around you isn't necessarily a believer? Are we asking ourselves, how can I go out next, Lord? What can I do? Who can I talk to next? Maybe we are. I'm not. I am now, but I haven't been for the last several years. And that I'm ashamed to say that, but that's the truth. The other thing that really kind of hit hard was my neighbors. Do I know my neighbors? I know their names. I talk to them when I see them outside. But I don't know my neighbors. And if I do know my neighbors, do I know them to the point of being able to share my salvation message with them? Can I tell them how I was saved and how God might be able to work in their life too? So I told you that it doesn't have to be hard to Evangelize. It doesn't have to be hard to have those conversations, but I haven't told you how to make it easier yet. So let's do that. I know this is a scary thing, and our field trip is going to play a part on this. But as history tells us, St. Francis said, preach the gospel at all times, and when necessary, use words. I always like that. I heard that in college. I've said it many times. I always like that. Because we don't have to stand on the street corner with a big sign saying everybody's going to hell. We don't have to stand at somebody's front door that we don't know and knock on it and say, hey, let me tell you how to get to heaven. We don't have to start there. Now, if God opens that door, I think you should knock on the door and tell them. But 
most of us, that's not how it works. We need to show the world that we're in. We need to show Rock Hill. We need to show this plaza that Christians are different, that Christians love people, and that we're here for them. And so is Jesus. So when you see, when you, when you go out into our world, we're very close off, right? Everybody's in a little group. They call it, I don't know, some sort of, everybody's understanding each other and we're all tolerant, whatever nonsense they want to say out there. But everybody has been singled off. And you're this or you're that. And you're not allowed to offend anyone. And you don't, you know, you, you walk on eggshells in fear that you might say something that someone's going to sue you over later. Like, it's just silly, the stuff that we deal with in our world today. But the universal language is love. And if I love somebody out in my world today that I normally, in their terms, shouldn't be loving on, it's going to make a statement. It's going to be different. It's going to allow people to see that there's something different about me, and that difference is Jesus. So, just like for the disciples, when it comes time to share your faith with the words, that time will come. But it also says here that the Holy Spirit will come upon them. And I can tell you from my own personal experience, there's been times when I've had the opportunity to share Jesus with others, that something happens and God takes over and allows that person to hear what God wants them to hear, no matter what the words fumble out of my mouth. So don't be afraid to share your Gospels, don't be, or share the Gospel. Don't be afraid to tell people about Jesus. But feel free to start with just loving somebody who normally wouldn't expect you to do so. So I told you we're going to do a field trip. And we are. And so I'm going to wrap it up here. And what I'd like to do is we have a table and chairs that we're going to bring around and set up. And we got all this stuff up here. The water and oranges, apples, some nuts, kind bars, trail mix. And I want to set up right out here on the sidewalk. And I don't know who's coming. I don't know if anyone will come. But maybe someone will come out of the plasma center that needs some protein. Maybe somebody will be walking down the sidewalk that needs some water. And we don't have to say, hey, I'm Joe from Church Miami, and I want to tell you about Jesus. But I can say, hey, you want some cold water? And if they ask me, I can tell them where we're from and what we're all about. Maybe somebody wants prayer. We don't know. Maybe nobody will come. But we have to do something. We can't talk about doing something and never do something. Because that's not what God's asked us to do. Actually, it's not what God told us to do. So just like that pickup truck and the guy who got out and helped the lady with the, with the lock, we've all been prisoners and we've been set free. Maybe we can find the lady who needs us to help her unlock her life and share Jesus with her. So if you're willing to stay for just a little bit after, you know, we'll see how long it takes. And when we're all ready to go, we can go, go to lunch, whatever. But I want to see Church 180 grow. I know each person in this room wants to see it too. But we can't do it if we don't go out there. 